Okay, I want to start this interview off a little different because I know this is something near and dear to your heart. So please bear with me. I don't know it by heart the way you do, but I want to read something, okay? Okay, cool. Okay, Jeremiah 29 and 11. For I know the plans I have for you. Hold on. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Absolutely. Why does that verse mean so much to you? Man, that's, um, that's my life verse. You know, with the journey I've traveled, with the experiences I've had in my life, my upbringing, uh, the situation I was born into, uh, I've clung on to that verse because of the things I've went through. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. And so for me, it was confirmation that no matter what you go through, no matter what you experience, no matter what you encounter, God still has a plan for your life. And as I've encountered some adversity and opposition along the way in my life, that verse has kind of shaped my perspective and how I view things that I've encountered. Now, were you always a spiritual guy? Were you brought up in the church? I know just in doing my research and having followed you for so long, I know your grandmother was very spiritual. Is this something that has always been part of who you are? Yeah, so... Um, I wasn't always just a spiritual dude. My grandmother was, my mother was, and they would take me to church. And like any other young cat, being there messing around, playing, sitting on the back pew with my cousin. And it wasn't until I got to college in my freshman year, and I came in contact with our chaplain. And he told me he wanted to disciple me and walk with me spiritually. And I asked him, could I bring some of my buddies with me because I wanted a level of accountability. And doing that walk, man, it kind of just shaped and molded me and it gave me structure and direction. And it challenged me, you know, and I'm a guy that I like to be challenged, right? Because I believe when I'm being challenged, that brings the best out of me. And so it wasn't until my freshman year of college to where I would say I really deep dive and got serious about my spiritual walk. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. I want to go backwards and then I'm going to bring it up to, the, to, to your college era. Okay. Talk to me. You often say how you born in Atlanta. Your mom was 16, if I have that correct? Yeah, she got pregnant at 15, had me at 16. Yep. Wow. What was, your, what was your upbringing like? So I was, I was born right downtown Atlanta, uh, Grady Hospital. I was taken to the southeast corner of Atlanta, to Kirkwood, two-bedroom home, 14 people. And um, my mother, she had me at 16. It was a lot of us in the house, you know, in that two bedroom with 14 people, it's uncles, it's cousins, it's aunties. And I was sleeping on the floor. You know, my whole childhood, I slept on pallets, me and my cousins. And so for me, I loved it, you know, to be honest, but I knew what we were up against, right? Because the blessing was I would get exposed to different things through sports. And so even though I was sleeping on the floor, when I would get with my coaches sometimes and I might go to their house and they kid might have a bedroom or something like that, I was able to see it. I would get exposure to certain environments, right? To how people were supposed to be living. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that my people was bad. We was just caught in the struggle of coming up in inner city. And I loved it. I, I experienced certain things, but I knew when I grew up, I wanted to have a different life. And I felt as if sports was a vehicle that I could give my family a different way of life. Now, were you always into sports? Yeah, yeah, I loved it, man, from the very beginning. And my mother put me in it because in my environment, you know, we had it all, man. We had drugs, we had gangs, we had violence. And my mother was working a double shift. And so she didn't want me just coming back home to that environment and just chilling in the neighborhood and trying to find something to do. And so every, every chance she got, you know, she was trying to send me off to a tournament or put me in some sort of sports to just keep me busy while she was at work. Now, there's this life-changing event that you often speak about, and I really want you to deep dive into that moment. You talk about you and your cousins, you're outside, you're playing. We or Anybody who's from the hood, we get yeah. it. We didn't have yeah. like, like these fields and, and you know these courts and grass and all of that kind of stuff. So y'all out there doing what everybody in the hood was doing, playing football in the street. Absolutely. You have a life-changing moment when just some random truck comes down that street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. So uh, we used to 
we used to come home sometimes and we would play football in the street and be getting after it, man, light pole to light pole. And when the street lights would come on, you know, that was our cue. We had to go in the house. And so it was getting dark and I had the ball, my three younger cousins in the street and this blue pickup truck was coming down the street. And so I stood on one side of the sidewalk, my three younger cousins stood on the opposite side and I was kind of waving the truck by, you know, because I knew it was getting to be that time. So I'm like, man, come on, man. And he was driving slow. And when he passed us, you know, we could see it was a white guy, mm-hmm. you know, and at the time, were no white guys in our neighborhood. And so when he got out of his truck, my uncles, they take off running. They think he's the police. <laughs> <laughs> Come up between our game, he was like, man, would y'all want to play football on grass? And I was like, man, I would love that, man. This street getting rough. He's like, go in the house, get your parents, get your guardian, let me talk to him. And my mother was at work and my uncle was in the house. And I went in the house, got one of my uncles, came out, said, man, you would talk to this guy? He said, sure. And he extended his hand. He said, my name is Trey Hurst. He said, I'm going to be honest with you. I just dropped the kid home a couple blocks over. And I was just leaving the neighborhood. He said, I see these little knuckleheads playing tackle football in the street. He said, I run a program across town. He said, if y'all sign them up, bring them out. Be a great opportunity for them and it can help them. And my uncle was like, man, I greatly appreciate it, but we just don't have the money for anything like that at this moment. He said, ain't mother. She's a single mother. She works a double shift. And he said, the other three, their fathers are in and out of prison. And the coach is like, no problem. He said, you bring him to the park tomorrow. I'll sign him up. I'll pay for it with my own money. And we got to that park the next day. And my man wasn't just paying for me and my three younger cousins. He was paying for kids all across Atlanta. Wow. And I wanted to understand just the spirit, you know, to make somebody do that. Like he had his own company. Like he didn't have to do that. Mm-hmm. And I just asked him one day, man, you know, after we got cool, I was like, man, why do you live life the way you live it? And he was like, as long as you live your life and make sure that somebody else's life is okay, he said, son, God will always make sure that your life is okay. And me and my three younger cousins in that street that he signed up to play ball was the only people in our family that ended up going to college. He broke a generational curse in our family. Wow, wow, wow. That's my man, man. Is is he still alive to this day? Absolutely. I still talk to him. That's my guy. To this day? To this day. So he knows what you've become? Absolutely. That's yeah. such a blessing, brother. That is such Absolutely. a blessing. Yes, sir. Can, can you take me back to that moment? Cause what, how old are you around this time? I was, I was eight, probably. Yeah, eight, nine, yep. At eight, nine years old, you had the sure. presence of mind to ask this man, why do you live life the way that you live it? Absolutely. Absolutely, man. Yeah. So, so because he, I, wasn't, I wasn't seeing it, Sean. You know? Uh-huh. Like when, you, when you don't see a behavior that's normal, it's intriguing to you. Mm-hmm. And so where, where I was, it was just cats hustling, cats trying to take, cats robbing, you know, the whole inner city, cats trying to finesse, you know, cats trying to get over. And when you see somebody doing something for you and don't really ask for anything in return outside of, man, just go to school, do good. You know, my man bought me and my cousins our first steak. You know, like wow. when this behavior is happening to you early, you're kind of intrigued, like, man, what's up with my man? You know what I'm saying? And then you see how he treats other people. Mm-hmm. And you're like, no, nah, that's who he is, right? And I want to understand why is he doing it? Because I didn't have my father in the household. And so I always tell kids, like, I used to go to sleep just with so many questions, right, that I want to answer as a young male, right? And most of the time, my coach was that guy that, that I put those questions on or one of my uncles. What's up guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.